Hello, everyone. Welcome to the third in the Center for Free Expressions series on threats to academic freedom. I'm Jim Turk, the director of the center. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the territory on which I am speaking to you today is the territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and today is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis. I also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaties signed with multiple Mississauga and Chippewa bands. I'd also like to thank the co-sponsors of today's panel, and they are the Canadian Association of University Teachers, the Institute for the Humanities at Simon Fraser University, and Penn Canada. Today, we're going to be looking at the threat of ethnic religious nationalism that it poses for academic freedom. In our event two weeks ago, we looked at that in the case of Israel and Palestine. Today, we are looking at the threats to the academic freedom faced by scholars in India and of India, one of the largest and most important countries in the world. Historically, the work scholars of a country's history, politics, and culture, uh, has that work has come under attack from those pursuing an ethno-religious nationalist agenda. And they're charged, uh, the scholars are charged with being anti-national or hostile to the dominant religion, ethnicity, culture, or traditions of the particular country. It's resulted in uh, a variety of forces trying to stop scholars from asking critical questions, making their work public, or even conducting their scholarly research and, and teaching. Today, we're going to explore what scholars of India are facing, both those based in India and those uh, based outside of India, how that is affecting teaching, research, and scholarship, as well as uh, what the public knows and doesn't know about India. And also we're going to explore what can universities do to protect the in integrity of scholarly work, of teaching and research and other scholarship in such a deeply fraught environment. We have a wonderful panel today, and I'd like to introduce them to you. First, I'd like to introduce Vinayak Chaturvedi. Vinayak is an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of California, Irvine. He specializes in modern South Asian intellectual and social history, and is the author of a recent book entitled Hindutva and Violence, published by the State University of New York Press. His writings on Hindutva and Hindu nationalism have appeared in many places in the modern intellectual history, post-colonial studies, South Asia, The Nation, The Wire, The Hindu, Scroll, and in the New Left Review. Welcome, Vinayak. Right, thank you. Thank you for having me. Our second panelist is Purnima Devon. Purnima is an associate professor in the Department of History at the University of Washington. Her publications include When Sparrows Become Hawks, The Making of Sikh, uh, Sikh uh, Warrior uh, Tradition, published by Oxford University Press, as well as essays on, on Mongol and uh, Sikh history. She is currently working on a new monograph exploring the ways in which uh, literary networks create uh, new identities and notions of public good in Mughal India. Welcome, Pranima. Thank you, Jim. It's an honor to be here. And our third panelist is Christoph Jaffrelo. He is a professor of South Asian politics and studies at the Centre d'Etudes et de Recherche Internationale at Sciences Po in Paris. He's also a professor of Indian politics and sociology at King's College London and a non-resident scholar at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace in Washington. He's also a regular commentator on Indian and Pakistani politics in publications and uh, in other events in France and the United Kingdom and North America and in India, where he writes a fortnightly uh, column uh, in the Indian Express. He's the author, co-author, editor or co-editor of more than 30 books. Um, one of his earliest uh, was the Hindu Nationalist Movement and Indian Politics, published in 1996, I believe. And his most recent is Modi's India, Nationalism and the Rise of Ethnic Democracy. I'm sorry, yes, Ethnic Democracy, published by Princeton University Press 
Welcome, Christoph. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for the invitation. And our moderator today was to be Joan Scott, who is a professor emerita at the School of Social Science at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, a remarkable historian recognized for her pioneering contributions to the study of French history, women and gender history, and feminist theory. Uh, and one of the leading experts in the world on academic freedom. Unfortunately, Joan contacted me earlier today to say that she had developed a very bad cough and cold, had lost her voice. Uh, and so unfortunately, is not gonna be able to be with us. Uh, so I'm gonna do my best to uh, stand in her stead. A formidable challenge, I must, uh, I must admit. Uh, the format for today's event is going to be a conversation among Vinayak, Purnima, and Christoph, that will go on for 45 to 50 or so minutes. And then we're going to bring the audience, uh, bring you and the audience into the conversation. So if uh, at any point as you're listening to the conversation, you have a question that comes to mind that you'd like to ask one of the panelists or the entire panel, uh, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A button. Just click on that uh, Q&A and write out your question. Uh, and when we come to that portion, when we're turning to the audience, uh, I'll ask Ange Holmes, who's the coordinator for the Center for Free Expression, to read out the first question. The panelists will have an opportunity to answer it, and then we'll go on to the next question. So do take advantage of this wonderful, knowledgeable panel to ask questions and bring up issues that you would like to have them address. Uh, and don't wait till I ask for uh, the audience's questions. Just write those down as you come to them. So um, I'd like to begin. Uh, with a quote about academic freedom from a statement uh, of North American-based academics who are members of the South Asian uh, Scholar Activist Collective. And in a document they write, academic freedom is a bedrock of the modern academy. It ensures that faculty and students are free to pursue research and teach, articulating ideas, arguments, and facts, free of intimidation or retaliation. Academic freedom is often attacked and infringed. They continue upon, upon uh, infringed upon in the context of Hindutva har harassment using an array of tactics. Hindutva tactics in this regard include pressuring universities to retaliate against faculty, violent threats, online harassment, generating controversy over matters of academic consensus, petitions, attempts to imperil employment, making bad faith accusations of bias and more, they conclude. So all of you have written about Hindutva at various points in your careers. Uh, could one of you define for the audience what Hindutva uh, is? Christoph, do you wanna? I can start. Uh, I'm sure uh, others will add to, to, to my definition. Well, Hindutva is a form of ethno-religious nationalism that crystallized in the 1920s and um, that considered that Hindus as the sons of the soil, the sons of the sacred soil, and um, the majority in the country embody the nation. So minorities, Christians, Muslims, who appeared later in history can certainly remain citizens of India, but by paying allegiance to the Hindu culture, to the Hindu uh, religious culture, if you want. Um, they can be Muslims and Christians in the private sphere, but in the public sphere, the Hindu symbols of identity uh, have to prevail. So there is this uh, hierarchy, if you want, which makes minorities, second class citizens, um, at least uh, in, in the most extreme way of putting this. And, but these extreme ways of defining this ideology were very much there already in the 1920s and 1930s. Purnima, do you have anything you'd want to add? Uh, sure. I guess to that I would add is, you know, uh, the scholars, thinkers, um, 
um, believers of Hindutva in its modern incarnation are also people who are espousing a particular view of the past, right? And that is of a very subjective view of the past that homogenizes what Hindu is. In other words, it argues for a homogeneity of belief, ritual practice, um, cultural outlets uh, of even the past uh, as it's narrated through history that is stripped of the diverse subjective viewpoints that um, most uh, countries, regions, and um, communities in South Asia have had. So in a way, particularly as a historian, um, I would say it, it impacts scholarly work in part because it imposes this homogeneity uh, that in fact does not exist. And uh, Vinak, you, I mean, your most recent book is Hindutva and Violence. Uh, is there anything you'd like to just add so the audience can understand? Sure. I mean, my, my, my book examined uh, the central architect of 20th century uh, Hindu nationalism. And he's seen as the individual who uh, contributed most to the conceptualization of Hindutva. And in his key text, uh, Essentials of Hindutva, he defines Hindutva in a very kind of um, a difficult way. I mean, he says Hindutva is not a word, but a history. I mean, it sort of builds on what Purnima just, just mentioned about the past. And his, but at the same time, he also states that Hindutva is not definable, right? So, but what he attempts to do in his writings, which was directly connected to the conversation, is to say that Hindutva is a very specific kind of history of Hindus. Um, and and without this history, uh, I argue that Hindutva cannot exist, right? So Hindutva, in, in fact, uh, the challenges facing academics and on, regarding academic freedom, is, I, I argue, is directly connected to this definition, uh, which the supporters of Hindutva propagate, is that, that in order to understand Hindutva properly, you have to understand this Hindu history um, of sort of Hindu victimization uh, and also Hindu glory simultaneously. So um, this that just kind of adds another layer to um, the the definitions that Chris, uh, Christoph and Purnima have out, uh, outlined. Well, in, in this context, um, I, I'd like to ask you just about uh, what are some of the uh, challenges that scholars in India who are doing studies of India research on India run into uh, when their views are seen uh, as as troublesome to uh, those from a Hindutva perspective. Just one of you start, it's okay. Yeah, I can, okay. I can start again. Uh, just to mention one case uh, um, that is for me really uh, symbolic of what has happened uh, recently, and, and that is the case of GNU, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi, the most prestigious center of excellence for social sciences, a university that uh, started in the 60s, that had been ranked number one for so many disciplines, history, sociological science, international relations. And a university that had always been criticized by the Hindu nationalists uh, because of its uh, quote unquote progressive um, approach of social sciences. So what happened after 2014 when Narendra Modi took over power um, made their life, the life of our colleagues at GNU almost immediately complicated. And for two main reasons. One was a new VC was appointed in 2016 and made sure that uh, the number of students diminished, the budget diminished. So it was much more difficult to do research and to teach. And secondly, and probably more importantly, the student union of the Song Parivar, we, we, we use this formula, Song Parivar, the family of the song, because the core organization 
the RSS, the Rashtriya Soyam Sivak Sangh. I'm sorry, can I interrupt, is um, the, can I interrupt you just for a moment? Could you explain? I, I, I was about to translate okay. that for you, don't worry. <laughs> this is this is the uh, organization of uh, the national volunteers. No, uh, Soyam Sivak means volunteer. Uh, Rashtriya, well, you find a root, uh, Indo-European uh, root, uh, we are very familiar with. Uh, Reich in German is Rashtr in uh, Hindi or Sanskrit. Um, so the um, RSS is uh, at the center of a nebula, a galaxy of organizations, including a student union. And this student union, ABVP, has been uh, given a free end on the campus, making the existence of alternative unions, dissident, quote unquote, uh, unions and teachers, uh, their targets. So we've seen GNU suffering a lot uh, and our colleagues suffering a lot, resisting, resisting, uh, most of them uh, are still resisting, but uh, if you want a clear example of how things have changed, you look at the trajectory of GNU. You, there, you'll have many other examples, even Delhi University. But I wanted to, well, select this one because for all of us, that was the alma mater of so many of our colleagues and peers and, and partners in crimes in social sciences. Do you, uh, do you have some other experiences or know of experiences of your colleagues in India? And, and yeah, I think that we could talk about these individual experiences that are of grave concern, but I want to talk to the scale of the problem, right? Okay. Um, currently, there are about 37.4 million students enrolled in Indian universities and colleges. You add academic staff and employees, and that swells to a population roughly similar to what would happen if all of Canada or of all of Poland was on a campus, right? In other words, we this is not a small problem. And if you look at scholars and data groups that track this activity, the kinds of things Christoph have just described, both at websites like Scholars at Risk, you can get multiple stories that are happening practically weekly of students getting attacked, professors not being allowed to teach the subjects they teach, the curriculum being censored, as well as quantitative data points. If you look at the Academic Freedom Index, of which a very interesting study just came out, India hasn't seen this level of academic repression since the emergency in the 1970s under Indra Gandhi's government, and it's getting worse. So in other words, there are large numbers of people who are facing this hostile environment and it spans uh, the level on all sides of the country from urban well-known metropolitan campuses like JNU, but also to smaller rural campuses where a new generation of Indian students who are usually the first in their families to attend these institutions are facing similar challenges. And it's the scale also that worries me because these numbers are huge. Mm -hmm. do you? Yeah, I mean, I would also take a, a, a maybe a, a sort of a larger kind of viewpoint. Um, I mean, if we think more recently, about a year ago, um, a member of the government um, announced that the new frontier of warfare in India was its own civil society. And the objective was uh, that to dismantle civil society as we know it, right? Um, that civil society was seen as a, is, seen, is now seen as a threat to the state. And so you have a, the, the bond between civil society and the state is, is, is not only fracturing, but breaking. So uh, academic institutions and academics are just one of many members of civil society that are, who are being targeted. Um, the transformations in publishing houses, transformations in the news media, newspapers, television channels, um, basically associational life as we know it in India is being completely transformed with these kind of changes. Um, and when the, the state is now saying that uh, its own civil society poses the greatest threat to the state, um, academics are at the forefront of those who have been constantly writing about questioning um, not only uh, state policies in the colonial period or the Mughal period, but also 
in uh, contemporary India in the 21st century. And so in a sense, um, the, the academics who are participating in writing about poverty, writing about gender inequities, writing about minority persecutions are seen as being potential threats to the stability of the state. So, uh, so there are tar we have colleagues who have had sedition charges uh, put against them. We've had colleagues whose works have been either banned or their books have not been published because they have been caught up in a legal case uh, because these texts are potentially causing a threat to the sentiments of Hindus. So you begin to see a very a range of things that are happening at the judicial level, um, at the surveillance level. Um, in addition to Christoph mentioning the ADDP, um, you know, not only threatening academics, but also attacking academics at various institutions. So you, you're sort of seeing a complete unraveling of uh, many aspects of what we, you know, celebrated in terms of academic freedom, uh, our colleagues in India, especially, um, that's happening right now. Um, and unless you are writing a glorified Hindu history, you are seen as either being anti-Hindu or anti-national, right? And this is something that's constantly repeated over and over and over again. And I and and it's it's this at it's at these levels um, you begin to see, you know, sort of. And as Purnima pointed out, you can there's listings of academics who've either been harassed, intimidated, attacked, and even assassinated. I mean, there were um, there are four very um, important cases um, of colleagues who were uh, murdered in South India. So you begin to see a, a, a range of things that are happening in India, and many colleagues who are not willing, in many ways, uh, because of intimidation, not uh, being able to speak openly about many of the threats and conditions that, that they were facing um, in India today. Um, as I understand it, um, unlike the pretty decentralized higher education systems that we have in Canada and the United States, things are more centralized in terms of the control of aspects of universities mm -hmm. in India. How does that play? How is that a factor in all of this and what the state can do? Well, when newly independent, uh, the system that was created in India was based on European models. Um, now, those models in Europe, of course, have been dismantled and reformed several times. But what has happened in India is a slightly different trajectory. Under Article 12 of the Constitution, higher education is supposedly in the state category, right? But we have also uh, the institution of the UGC, the University Grants Commission, that bears important responsibility for setting standards for uh, what universities can do, their accreditation, what kind of faculty can be hired. Every commission to discuss reform or changing the UGC, and they have been plenty in the last 60 years, uh, has attempted or argued for the autonomy of institutions. But what we have seen in the past decade is in fact the autonomy of higher educational institutions in India has shriveled considerably. And the concerns that are being raised, because there have been in the last three years some serious discussions about doing away with the UGC and replacing it with another model of a institution, does not do away with that centralization, right? So this is a very powerful body. Um, uh, various faculty groups have taken, you know, uh, legal proceedings against decisions taken by it. Part of the complaints is many of the people in charge in the councils that represent different disciplines, as well as the UGC, do not have the academic credentials, are not serious published scholars with peer-reviewed publications in the fields that they represent. Um, there has also been discussions about the pressure faced by doctoral and postdoctoral students whose stipends are uh, sent out through this. So part of the problem is the centralization. And you know what we're seeing right now is a Hindu repression. What we saw in the emergency was when Mrs. Gandhi was in charge was a slightly different political leaning towards the left, but an equal kind of campaign of terror on campuses. So in that sense, I think having that centralized control allows the party that has power to really tighten the screws on not just faculty and the university administration very often insert people who will bend to the will of the political party in charge. It also, because of the weight control stipends and control standards, uh, has a chilling effect on student participation in academic life as well. So it's a very powerful body. When, yeah. I'm sorry, go yeah, ahead. Well, yeah, just to say that um, 
federalism makes some difference and and the situation in Tamil Nadu is definitely not similar to uh, the situation in Gujarat or, for instance but what is very important to factor in is that in addition to the state and then centralized machine Purnima has just described you have the network of vigilante groups <laughs> so it's a it's a kind of joint venture you have the official and the unofficial sources of control and intimidation. And, and I mentioned the uh, student union, ABVP, because it is exerting a kind of cultural policing on campuses, but you have many other uh, vigilante groups exerting similar forms of surveillance. Can you and give us some examples? Yeah, of course, you can, you can look at uh, an organization called Bajrangdal. Bajrangdal is a, a vigilante group that is the uh, youth wing of one of the major uh, components of the Song Parivar, the Vishwendu Parishad, VHP. And they are also patrolling uh, cities to make sure that uh, dissenters cannot get away with their own separate way of doing things. So this is this is a way to have a kind of deeper state. You know, a deep state is a state where you have an official police controlling society. A deeper state is a state where society controls society. And 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 I think it is something uh, academics have been uh, affected by. Everybody has been affected by this kind of modus operandi. And and as Purnima said. Um, the kind of Hinduism that is promoted that way is, of course, very Brahminical, very upper caste. So we see those who are not part of this milieu, I would say, uh, victims twice of, of not being in, in the norm. Uh, that goes beyond academics, but we can't look at academics only when we look at uh, uh, freedom of being uh, under attack in India. I mean, with the creation of private universities in India, some have argued, well, they are able to avoid some of these pressures, but is that the reality? I would say no, because we have fairly prominent cases, for example, of um, visa revocations of people either teaching or an administrative post at Nalanda University, for example, uh, that were revoked. Um, there was a case with uh, Ram Chandra Guha at a private university in Gujarat, where you know he was offered a position and then it was preached. And part of this has to do not just with the government bureaucracy, as Christoph has pointed out, you know, there is a kind of social monitoring and pressure that is going on now. Now, this is part of a globalized phenomena, right? Social media has created platforms where harassment, trolling, and the exertion, not just of verbal, but outright physical threats and harm can be targeted on specific individuals or specific institutions in extremely violent um, and concerning ways. So that level of harassment can make a private university or the administrators of that private university or faculty there buckle, right? And we see this over and over again, where public events get canceled. Uh, invitations to speak on particularly politically sensitive topics uh, will be revoked and those will be canceled as well. So I think in a certain way, all the promise that privatization had for education and this this idea of taking away control from these more centralized government run institutions has not really lived up to the hype. No, I, I, would, I would also uh, I would also add that you know I mean these private institutions are often funded uh, and started by uh, multi, you know uh, individuals who have a great deal of wealth. Um, and their wealth is oftentimes, and so this is a, a service that they feel they're providing in creating educational institutions. But at the, uh, but on the other hand, um, there have been these studies done by economists um, who've shown that um, that even the corporate sector in India has refused to question the authority of the BJP government for fear that of retaliation um, for contracts for a whole range of 
things that would affect their bottom line. So you have this kind of conflict where you have these very wealthy uh, Indian uh, industrialists and capitalists who have chosen to invest in private universities, uh, but the government can still exert pressure on them uh, to uh, create certain kind of changes in administrators who don't uh, you know, who are critical of the government or academics who are critical of the government. And so you begin to see either re uh, forced resignations or um, individuals who step down uh, without any explanation. And more, more often than not, it's, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's in large part because of these, uh, this sort of the shadow of the state uh, putting its, uh, exerting its pressure even on the capitalists who are in other ways interested in, you know, uh, building educational institutions. So you have both these dynamics at play. And I guess the, the other thing to kind of build upon what Purnima had said early on with the UGC and the constitution, I mean, uh, within the constitution, um, there's also a section on fundamental rights in which um, no religious instruction, and I'm just reading, shall be provided at any educational institution maintained through state funds. And I think one of the things, if the BJP does get reelected in the next round of elections, I think this is another target of uh, constitutional change that we're going to see um, that's going to allow for state funds uh, for Hindu uh, educational institutions to be built and transformed at, uh, and transforming university syllabi, which is already beginning to happen as well uh, in other ways. So I think all of these things are in play uh, simultaneously. Well, the three of you are scholars of India, and you're in North America or Europe. Uh, so we've been talking about pressures that scholars in India are facing. But are you, well, let's start with your colleagues. Is this an issue for South Asian scholars outside of India? And if so, how? Well, of course it is. Purnima, you were about to speak. Well, I was going to say that you cannot teach in South Asian studies anywhere in the world without being aware of these pressures, right? Um, if your work is not directly impacted, the minute you sign a petition in uh, favor of protecting somebody else's academic freedom rights or scholars that are being explicitly targeted by Hindutva, as many people have, you know, on behalf of well-known historians like Professor Romila Thapar in India, but also Audrey Trishka in the United States. The first thing that will happen is your email inbox will fill uh, with vitriol, with hate speech, not just simply disagreeing with you, which is fine. You know, this is uh, disagreement is common and fine, but it often boils down to uh, offering physical attacks using very derogatory language. So certainly I have received those cut and paste kinds of emails uh, and I reported them to the campus police, but it also gives you a sense of the particular privilege of working in an environment and having a tenure track job in a university that will protect your rights and in a place where you can actually depend on the local police to come to your help should you be the threat of attack not every scholar has that privilege so yes i don't think people in the united states are immune from it and certainly those of us who have friends and family in india one of the constant concerns is will they become a target will I be denied a visa to go home and visit or to do research? So I would say the flip side of that is not just concerns about the safety of loved ones or for colleagues, but also my concern is the growing self-censoring and self-silencing among scholars all around the world, in part because they fear what will come from even doing a simple thing like signing a petition. Ben Ayak or Christoph, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I mean, uh, in speaking to more and more colleagues who do research in India, and I mean, uh, this has not happened to me, but I mean, just multiple colleagues that I've spoken to, that entering India often results in a conversation about their publications, which I found very in interesting. A um, uh, colleague said that, you know, he arrived uh, at the airport and the immigration officer said, oh, you have a very interesting list of publications. And he said, how do you know about my publications? And he said, well, uh, I have a list in front of me. Um, and so um, the collapsing of data uh, between uh, immigration data with publication data, I'm sure it's not that difficult, 
but I, that experience has never happened anywhere else that I've traveled or heard from any uh, um, from other folks. So you you there is an awareness that there's a greater level of surveillance. Um, and with the internet, it, of course, you know, we post our articles, our articles oftentimes are very easily available online. So that monitoring at one level is not surprising, but the open declaration that we are monitoring your writings as you're entering the country seems to be increasing for academics who are uh, entering the country. So, I mean, those are certain things. I mean, more personally, um, I mean, there was a Hindutva leader who came to my campus, uh, wanted to meet with me. Um, and due to certain circumstances, I met with this individual. And one of the things he immediately told me was that, you know, his entire objective uh, and the goal of his organization was to dismantle the works of anyone who was interested in Marxism, feminism, subaltern studies, and critical theory. So, I mean, in a sense, they're aware of these, this body of work, uh, and they want to dismantle it, right? And they're open about talking to individuals and saying that this is our goal, right? Um, but with, along with that, he also talked about monitoring my family, right? So he kind of knew all sorts of personal information about me and my family um, as well. So you have... Um, and and this is and then you know family members receiving anonymous phone calls. So in addition to the emails being you know sent, um, receiving anonymous phone calls you know to my parents and things saying you know maybe you should talk to your son and not have him publish certain kinds of things, right? So you have this level of in intimidation that's already beginning to happen here um, with family members. So it wouldn't be surprising if family people are concerned about their family members in India, if that kind of stuff is happening in North America or Europe as well, right? So, so these are certain kinds of, you know, smaller kind of uh, more personal kind of uh, things that are happening. But I think each of us would have similar stories. Uh, some of us would like to talk to each other about it, others don't. So we don't have a full sense of the scale of, of what's going on, but we do know that it's going on. Um, yeah. Christophe, do you, yeah. what's been your experience? Yeah. Well, my experience is very similar, of course, and, and you do not need to sign petitions for receiving uh, eight mails, you know. The only work we do, <laughs> just doing field work, writing books, footnoted, peer-reviewed articles, well, they are attacking any ID that is not part of their own narrative. And, and they have a very clear idea of what the history of India is, the way it should be taught. Uh, they have already, uh, we mentioned the syllabus of universities, the syllabi of universities, they have already removed from many uh, syllabi things they did not want to, to see taught, including Arke Ramanujan, many Ramayanas, there, there, there cannot be many Ramayanas, there can be only one Ramayana. But um, it's really the work we do that is in itself the cause for attacks. Now, these attacks can be of different kinds. And I think what makes a big difference when you're not in India, but abroad, is whether you are in a country with a large diaspora or not. And I can see the contrast between uh, UK and France because I commute between both countries. And uh, in UK, you see gradually this tension, pressure mounting. Uh, it goes with infiltration of some academic spheres, uh, including the um, editorial committees of journals, including uh, associations of Asian studies, South Asian studies. With the support of the I Commission, this is well oiled. And I, I, I repeat, you have the official and the unofficial, and they work hand in hand. And by contrast, in France, where the diaspora is much smaller, uh, the pressure is much less, certainly not in the classroom, where we can see it elsewhere now. Uh, and the university system is defending the scholars who are attacked in a remarkable way. You know, um, I could really initiate judicial procedures with the full support 
financial support in the first place uh, of, of my institutions in France, uh, because this kind of red line cannot be crossed. Uh, when elsewhere, there is probably a, a balance of power that make them push us in, in much more easily. And, and the resistance is, is more difficult to organize. So I would, like, I would like just to say that we need to factor in this variable, the diaspora, and we need to be precisely watching closely the impact of the diasporas on the university systems of US, UK, Canada, because these are long-term implications. Uh, Bernard, could you maybe to illustrate the, the point that Christophe was making, uh, could you talk about what happened to this big conference on dismantling Hindutva that was sponsored by, as I understand it, 20 or 30 of the leading North American universities and the reaction to it? Yes. Um, I. So, again, I think... Uh, there was uh, there are these uh, Hindu American organizations um, that are well funded um, um, again by members of the diaspora. Uh, different individuals uh, spend uh, millions of dollars funding these organizations. Um, some of them uh, target educational institutions. Some of them target. Uh, uh, it's in California, for example, the textbook. Um, issue. Um, others uh, see themselves as lobbyists. Um, so there's a proliferation of these organizations um, that are going on. Um, and this or, this academic conference uh, dismantling Hindutva was, um, was targeted uh, and there was a concerted effort. Um, I will not mention the name of one of the organizations simply because um, they're extremely litigious. Um, and um, in, in uh, one of in an article that I had written um, uh, talking about Hindu phobia, uh, the head of the organization uh, uh, publicly announced that what I was doing was hate speech uh, for uh, being critical of the organization. And so you have um, various forms of intimidation and but at this conference, um, they had organized uh, about a, a letter writing campaign um, uh, in which um, and organized a Hindu temples uh, to also participate all sorts of associational groups in North America and Europe uh, as well. Um, and were uh, targeting uh, university um, uh, administrators and sort of saying that you were promoting uh, certain forms of hate speech. Um, as well as violating the rights of Hindus by uh, having this uh, co-sponsoring this conference. And in addition to that, the trolls, um, and there have been studies done on the trolling that was done, um, this uh, organized trolling from India and in North America and in Europe um, to target academics and university administrators um, regarding uh, not having this academic conference. So, I mean, my concern was that here you have a conference that's an academic conference uh, without anyone even knowing what's going to be argued. It was being it was being targeted simply because of the names of the individuals who are attached to it uh, for the title of the conference itself. Um, as, and that was kind of it, right? And it was an extremely, um, I mean, I was not involved in the organizing of the conference, but just uh, as a colleague in the field, watching what is happening to other colleagues um, who do similar kind of work that I do um, was really kind of, you know, I mean, it was both shocking, but also realizing that um, different university administrators are going to respond differently. And I think that's one of the outcomes that comes across that um, many university administrators do not know the distinction, uh, do not understand uh, Indian history, do not understand the political scene. And, um, are open to tar open to accepting um, the word of the the community um, that the what we are doing as academics is promoting hate speech, right? If we want to reduce it to that, um, so it became uh, very controversial for that reason, right? And um, and in excess of a million uh, letters apparently were sent to different universities. Um, what Punimir was mentioning, this flooding of e email boxes, uh, was something that was targeting. 
uh, university administrators who knew nothing about South, you know about what was going on, but suddenly were inundated and were shocked that this was happening, right? And so to what and uh, to educate our administrators, right? I mean, is is the biggest challenge because um, if administrators are faced with uh, both uh, concerns and threats, um, and simultaneously they're they're worried about the the bottom line regarding donations to the university. Um, and I think the Hindutva folks in North America have figured this out really well, that, you know, that both levels uh, of, of, of tactics with university administrators will work. Um, but I don't know. I mean, Purnima may have uh, additional things to say about the, the conference. That Well, what's happening here is a drowning out of the, you know, diverse voices within the diaspora, right? So even at the conference, for example, you had progressive groups like Hindus for Human Rights, among others, you know, groups that work with feminists. Uh, in the South Asia scholarly and lay community, uh, Dalit right activists, all of these very diverse different voices get drowned out because people mobilizing on that Hindutva network are now claiming to speak for everybody of South Asian origin and all Hindus, which if you think about it is a bit audacious. I mean, I'm a scholar. I would never claim to speak for all South Asians or even all the members of the communities I study. I fully acknowledge the diversity of experiences, subjectivities, and voices there. Um, but this is really problematic because if you think about it, both in Canada and the United States, um, South Asian groups are a fast growing presence. Uh, on campus, they are beginning to outnumber students from China, for example. And these students also come with diverse perspectives, uh, diverse political beliefs, diverse religious practices. And they are being subjected to the same kind of surveillance and pressure tactics that are being exerted against academics, right? And I do want to always keep the student experience at the back of my voice when I talk about Hindutva harassment because our students are in fact the most vulnerable. Professors have forum, like the one we are indulging in right now, right? Where we can talk about this race consciousness, race awareness for the average student who might be either new to the country or for the first time starting off on their college and university journey, to be leveled to this level of pressure, to be told that they cannot speak about certain topics without being thought of as bigots or haters or Hindophobes, even when they come from those communities themselves and are perfectly enlightened to have whatever their own perspective on these issues are, is in fact an organized form of harassment and silencing. And we need to take it seriously because academic freedom includes freedoms not just for academics, it includes freedom for students. That is why universities are created, right? We cannot create walls about what students can say or speak or explore while they are on their journey of learning. So the vulnerability of those populations and that of lecturers who are on partial contracts, who do not have security of tenure, those vulnerable populations on campuses are particularly, particularly vulnerable to this kind of harassment. I mean, one, one example that I saw at my own university, at Toronto Metropolitan University, was when a colleague of mine was working with the Toronto Public Library as part of its big speaker series and helped arrange to bring Kristoff in as a speaker. Mm -hmm. And subsequently, the university came under enormous criticism for having allowed that faculty member to bring in Kristoff to be a speaker. Uh, I mean, it was actually the public library, Toronto Public Library, the largest in Canada, that had him as a speaker and was quite honored to do so. But the university came under attack for because a faculty member at the university had participated and the attack was not just, uh, I mean, the Indian High Commissioner contacted the university to object, so it works through the state, but also colleagues, South Asian colleagues at the university complain. So the diaspora aspect of it extends from not only the state to the organizations that exist, but individual faculty. Uh, I don't know if others of you encountered that, but I was quite surprised to see that. And it was all about allowing one of the leading scholars on South Asia to speak at the Toronto Public Library. Well, that's precisely it, right? Uh, it's not about questions that are raised in the Q&A part of a session. 
it's not about writing a letter of protest after the event has taken place, right? Most of this organizing is about silencing anything before it happens or having an impact on curricula that are being created first for K-12, which they were very active there. And now at the, even at the university level where certain subjects, books or ideas cannot be taught or discussed. Uh, is there any indication, uh, uh, Vinayak, you mentioned uh, donors. I mean, there are some very wealthy uh, people in the South Asian community who are sympathetic to uh, or come out of uh, this movement, uh, part of the BJP or otherwise, uh, of them funding uh, institutes or making, you know, we have a long history in North America of the Koch brothers in the United States and other wealthy individuals trying to insert their views of the world into universities and override uh, normal academic uh, procedures for ensuring the integrity of the university. Is that an issue we're seeing in this case? Yeah, I mean, we experienced that at my university um, about six, seven years ago, where a wealthy group of donors uh, wanted to establish multiple chairs of Hindu studies. And, uh, you know, there was a whole range of legal and other problematic issues um, uh, and for administrators, uh, the realization that that this is low hanging fruit for money, right? I mean, because I mean, this is also a reflection of the changing nature of the American um, and North American university and also European university, especially in, especially in Britain, where uh, university administrators uh, most part of their job or most of their job is now fundraising, right? And and they're their positions to be renewed are contingent on the amount of money that they can raise. And that creates an awkward dynamic, right? Because um, if their uh, employment is based on bringing in money and you have these wealthy donors willing to give money, but with the contingency that certain kinds of programmatics are in place, that it becomes a very ad hoc nature depending on the ethics of different university administrators. I mean, that's what it boils down to, right? And I've talked to some very senior administrators in the United States, and I said, you know, I asked them, well, would any university administrator turn down 30 million, 50 million, 100 million dollars? And the answer is no, right? Irrespective of the, uh, irrespective oftentimes of where the money is coming from, right? So I think the model of the Koch brothers, the model, other models that exist within the American Academy are being reproduced. I mean, we do have uh, venture capitalists in the Bay Area who have suddenly discovered the RSS and now are, you know, spending huge amounts of money um, to bringing historians uh, who are attached to the RSS to the United States to create an institute. Um, we are seeing the replacement and simultaneously in India um, with the ICHR uh, of, of rewriting India's history as well. So you have the Indian state participating, Indian, and then here you also have venture capitalists participating. And it, it's not, you know, so one can imagine that down the road that if university administrators aren't educated on what the, the stakes are, um, it's very easy to take money in that sense, right? Institutions are dependent on it, their jobs are dependent on it. And whether faculty are going to be consulted oftentimes remains unclear, right? And it's it depends on institution. Uh, it depends on each institution and each institution's administration um, who would be willing to do um, the due diligence. And I'm, I'm afraid that oftentimes university administrators are not willing to do the due diligence, right? And that becomes part of the problem that we are in and we are facing moving forward. Christopher uh, Purnima, do you have anything you want to add before we turn to the audience? Well, no, just... we can Sorry. There are ways to move forward on this. You know, I would point to uh, SESAC's website on Hindutva harassment. It also has an area of where if you are an ally, if you want to do something about this, um, we have resources where you can educate yourself. Uh, we have uh, different sections of the handbook that I address to university administrators. Half the job here is just education because particularly in North America, in the US and Canada, where you have university administrators who might be quite uninformed about what is at stake in these conversations when donors show up or an event explodes on campus. Um, some may have experts sitting right there that they can consult with in their own universities and others may not because South Asian studies is not a huge field still. 
um, I would direct those eyeballs to that website because there, there are places where you can at least get some information and share it beyond what the scholarly collective here is. I should tell the audience uh, tomorrow we're going and I'll mention this at the end. Uh, as with all our events, we're going to post a video of the event so others can see it, but we're also going to post uh, various resources uh, that you can look into if you want to read more about these things, and, and a link to that website will be part of what will be posted tomorrow. But the, the challenge that university administrators face, or even our colleagues who aren't, don't know, aren't, you know, aren't South Asian scholars, is the pressures are coming from all sorts of sources, including from some of their own colleagues. Uh, I think it, it creates a very difficult situation to sort out what to do in this when there's this concerted attempt to restrict and rewrite. I mean, I'm still struck by that uh, dismantling Hindutva conference. I can't remember a conference that was co-sponsored by more prestigious universities in North America than that one. And yet those universities were just inundated, as you've described, with uh, email with tweets with uh, attacks for for having permitted uh, or having in any way been involved in the conference. So why don't we why don't we turn to the audience? Ange, do you have a first question for us? Uh, yeah, I do want to remind attendees uh, to please use the Q and A to ask questions at any moment, especially now. Um, the first question is from Matthew, uh, and Matthew is just uh, wanting some clarification. Uh, Vinayak, you talked about uh, the name of the architect of Hindutva at the beginning, I believe. And uh, Matthew you would just like some clarification for those who have not read the book. Sure. Um, so the individual is, his name is uh, Vinayak Damodar Savarkar. Um, that's S-A-V-A-R-K-A-R. -A and um, his writings are, uh, many of his writings, his key writings are available in English. Um, I would, if you're interested, I would encourage people to read his uh, Essentials of Hindutva, which is a short book, uh, uh, which was published in 1923 in English. Um, but um, there, his writings are voluminous, and there's no shortage of writings. It's easy to find. Um, so I would, yeah. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, uh, you can feel free to email me. Uh. Okay, thank you. And and a second question? Uh, yeah, it's another one from Matthew. Uh, and Matthew uh, says, um, uh, Canada has a fairly large Indian, Indian and Hindu diaspora. Any idea it, how it has an impact on Canadian academics? The RSS flag was raised on Canadian par on uh, Parliament Hill in November 1st to celebrate the Canadian Month for Hindu heritage. RSS is more and more present in Canada, but how about in the academic field? I come from a Canadian Francophone institution, still quite under the radar. Well, I guess that's a hard question for the three of you to answer because you're not Canadian academics, uh, but perhaps you might answer it in regard to your own countries. And I know that there are some in the audience who are Canadian academics who who studied this. So if if one of you wants to write a response that Ange could share, or that that would be welcome. But in the meantime. Uh, is uh, how would you answer it with regard to the United States when I have our opinion? Well, I, I am reminded of uh, this fairly notorious example of Indian Independence Day celebrations in New Jersey, uh, which more recently featured a bulldozer, um, basically praising the current chief minister of the state of Uttar Pradesh, Yogi Adityanath, uh, in his homage because he used bulldozers to essentially destroy the homes of Muslim families and dissenters in the state. And um, there were members of um, the Indian diaspora groups present who were witnessing this, who protested, uh, including uh, Muslim organizations as well as Hindu organizations and others who could not see what the fuss was about. Uh, the levels of ignorance about South Asian politics is everywhere and politicians I think are very keen to mobilize these groups but they often do it in very clumsy ways if an affinity group comes and offers them an opportunity to uh, you know celebrate a particular holiday event or to raise a flag or to mark a particular commemoration they 
tend to take people at their word and just move along with it. Um, I think this is where the diasporic affinity groups need to step up a little bit, right? And I say that as a member of that community, not just as a scholar, where if you want your full diverse set of beliefs out there in the civic space and in the public square, you need to speak up. Because part of what is happening here is these groups are mobilizing in order to really use the language of diversity and inclusion to take a political belief that is about exclusion and homogeneity and trying to use that to basically argue that their version of Hindutva Ness needs to be celebrated by, you know, marking holidays such as this. So... I mean, the point you're making is a really important one of how inclusion and diversity is being used as a cover for actually eliminating diversity yeah. and diminishing inclusion. Um, is this a is this an issue that you've dealt with, Christoph, or seen? Well, they are using the vocabulary of democracy all the time. Uh, and this is precisely why they want to silence us. Because the facade, the facade they want to cultivate is a facade of respectability. You know, uh, Hindu nationalism claims that it has nothing to do with extremism. Extremism is something for the Muslim. It is violent by nature. They are non-violent by nature. You know, they, they claim that there is absolutely no violence on their side, from their side. When, when there is violence, it is attributed to the legitimate self-defense of individuals. For instance, we will speak about mob lynchings in India. It's always the mob defending the sentiments of its religion that justifies a kind of self-defense. Um, so when we're talking when we're talking about lynchings, we're talking about primarily lynchings of Muslims, are we not? Yeah, of course. This is the point. This, this is the point. Uh, most of them are accused of slaughtering cows, so on and so forth. So this is a very important point because it makes any analysis by scholars dangerous for them because any analysis exposing them uh, will inevitably uh, show that uh, they are not at all the kind of people they claim to be and the kind of people the West thinks they are. This is, of course, the huge, I would say, misunderstanding. The West is still looking at India as the world's largest democracy, balancing China, the most authoritarian and, 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 and threatening uh, country today. So we are targeted not after we say anything, before we say anything. And, and I think it's precisely the reason why they, they operate that way. Now, we continue to speak. Some of us at least continue to speak but they have silenced many people. They have also somewhat silenced people who fell in line. And they fell in line because it's easier, even if they do not believe fully, at least in this ideology, they prefer to live the comfortable life of remaining part of the intelligentsia. Some of them have been persuaded convinced, but many others just don't have the sense of sacrifice, professionalism, whatever you mean, whatever it is, um, because it's very tough. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Uh, but yeah, till now, we are still a group of people who are not silenced yet. Ange, do you have a, a question for the for the panel? Uh, yeah. Um, so Barbara Williamson um, is, says, I think this will happen today in a couple of hours in Vancouver. Some foreign students have organized a walkout demonstration of protest, an enormous increase in already high fees for foreign students, in this case at Emily Carr University. 
I'm wondering if the government of India or any of the organizations you have named contribute to financial assistance for students studying abroad? And if so, does the amount of these fees affect the vulnerability of students to the various pressures you were describing? Hmm. So I can speak to that. I, I think it does, right? And in fact, there's been a lot of media coverage about that, particularly in the wake of the coronavirus when many Indian students studying abroad found themselves stranded. Uh, in fact, you had this moment in London where students basically surrounded the Indian High Commission demanding uh, some kind of help uh, to get them out of the situation. The problem is a lot of the students are working in areas that are very high cost cities, right? London is one, New York, um, Vancouver, Seattle, all of those would be high cost cities. And their stipends are often not enough to cover the high cost of housing, as well as the educational expenses that they're seeing too, which means that they are vulnerable at several levels. Often they're living in housing that is not completely safe, but they're also dependent on fellow Indian students who may or may not be better healed with them for such very, very common things like a weekly trip to the grocery store to uh, you know, fix your lot and uh, get food. Or if you get sick, somebody to take you to the doctor. And we need to think about these everyday concerns because if your entire safety network depends on people with whom you need to maintain good relationships, even if their political and social views are toxic to you, you will keep quiet. Right. You can also be afraid of losing your fellowship or stipend funds. We saw that in the wake of the international protests that took place across universities following the CAA announcements by the Indian government. So I do think many of these students are extremely vulnerable. And the question of high fees is also another global one. Very, very recently, fees across Indian universities were sent up and there were quite a few students out protesting on their various campuses because of it. Um, many students are first generation students, those who are coming abroad as well as people who are protesting in India. Their parents can barely afford the high cost of sending their kids to college, particularly if they have more than one child. So in those circumstances, when your only lifeline to an education and improving not just the financial circumstances of your own future, but that of your entire family, there's a lot of pressure to just behave, keep quiet and to the line. And frankly, I don't blame them for doing that. I think in their foot, you know, in their shoes, I would be probably doing the same. I, I just want to ask a follow up question. Uh, Christoph, you were talking about how there are student organizations in India that are are actually supported by and uh, encouraged by the state. Uh, is there any indication that uh, there's similar kind of support by the state of India or by wealthy uh, BJP, BJP supporters for student uh, groups and student movements in North America or in Europe? Of course. You know, these student unions have been duplicated in the diaspora. You know, the, the, the Sound Parivar now is a global organization. Uh, the RSS has a different name in UK, in US, in Canada. It is called Hindu Sivak Sang, so the organization of the Hindu volunteers. And they started to create their own branches as early as the 60s, 60s, 70s. Canada, especially after... Um, Eastern Africa became independent when you had so many people who left Kenya, Uganda, and came to Canada, came to uh, UK. Uh, you had a wave of migrants, and that was that gave them a good opportunity mm -hmm. to, to build their own network. So you have student unions, all kinds of fundraising organizations, charities, which are directly connected to RSS. And you see on the university campuses, these groups also very active. Uh, what, what happened in Leicester recently in UK, this, this kind of transfer, transposition of the Hindu Muslim conflict in Britain was partly activated by these organizations. And, and that's why the UK government, the American government, are realizing that they need to understand what's going on there. They have been very much lenient. Now, I think 
they have missed one very important phase, the infiltration of many decision-making processes, many very strong institutions, including the Conservative Party in UK by these groups. So you have the vote bank that is made of Hindus. You have also the money they give to these organizations. And it's true of, of course, uh, parties in the US as well. Now we are entering a new world when these questions are not only uh, national, but globalized. And the kind of conflicts which were there are now disseminated across the globe. It's true of this conflict, it's true of many others, but yet at the university level, because this is the level we are interested in, we have definitely to watch what's going on because there'll be a point of no return and then we will not be free in the classroom the way we were. And that's, well, social sciences will suffer and that's something we don't want. Yeah, I'm, I would uh, build on what Christoph said and I would, I would even argue that pretty much every major, at least American university, has a branch of the HSS on its campus today. Um, and and clear, the HSS is so HSS is is what Christoph yeah. is. It's the it's the um, uh, the Hindu Swayam Swayam Sevak Sangh, so the Hindu Volunteer Association. So it's the the parallel organization of the RSS in India. The HSS exists in the U.S. And so that's what the organization that Christoph was mentioning. And I would I was saying that I would argue that almost every campus, major campus in the US has an HSS branch on it. Um, and, um, and one of the tactics that came out of the California high school textbook debates um, that happened um, was um, the realization that if students file grievances with university administrators, um, that their religious sentiments are being hurt, um, they'll have a much quicker response. Um, so these high school students in California now are university students. And what we're beginning to see um, is that this tactic is now being advocated that, you know, if a professor says something in a class that hurts your religious sentiment, um, that you should file a grievance against the professor uh, as a tactic, right? Um, I mean, I never used to have bef before when I started teaching 20 odd years ago at my university, where students would come up and ask me what my position on Narendra Modi was. That's beginning to happen more and more, right? Um, and my and and so my question always to them is like, you know, what is what is the value added for knowing that information for you, right? I mean, I mean, you're asking that question from a specific perspective, um, but what is it that you really want to know? Right. Um, they're never able to answer that question. And and so I say I'm more than happy to talk to you about whatever you want to talk about when the class is over. But during the if it's not part of the syllabus, I'm not going to talk to you about it. And if you want to read my work, you, you're welcome to read my work. It's publicly available. But you're beginning to see these small changes that are happening, these behavioral changes among students who are feeling much more empowered, in part because they're being told that there are these certain tactics as a way to uh, challenge the, the expertise and the scholarly um, you know, knowledge of your professors by simply filing grievances of a particular type. And that is something that is also quite worrying that if again, university administrators are not going to be siding with their own faculty, this is gonna be creating uh, a different level of problem that we didn't anticipate before. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Uh, and uh, do you have another question for us? Uh, yeah, I do. The next one is from Sanjay. Uh, Sanjay says this has been a terrific a terrific conversation analyzing various aspects of threats to academic freedom in India and abroad on multiple levels. Thank you for hosting it, Jim. Uh, there is yet a wider political context, the rise of China and assertiveness of Xi Jinping in multiple arenas, which has given the current government in India tremendous cover. The new Indo-Pacific strategy unveiled by Ottawa this week is the latest example. Can you comment on this? Before they comment, I, do, I want to make one comment. Uh, as I said in the beginning, this is the first of a series of panels that the center is the second of a series, the first focused on Israel and Palestine and scholars of Israel and Palestine and the challenges they face. 
This one's focusing on scholars of India. The next one is going to focus on scholars of China, where I think some of these issues that the uh, questioner is asking about will be discussed. But having said that, uh, if any of the panelists have anything they want to say in response to this comment or question. Well, as I said, I think uh, Western countries have been very lenient vis-a-vis -vis India because of China. And uh, because things look much worse in China and because China is putting a threat that is much more immediate than India, we do not in the West pay sufficiently attention to, to what we are talking about and, 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 and the risk. India is not seen, Hindus are not seen as posing any threat to our societies. And secondly, we are also seeing Islamophobia as one of the reasons why, well, they may be excessive, but at last, or at least, they have identified the real enemy. Huh? Uh, we may not follow them in their extreme views, but still, they have they are targeting a minority, the Muslims, which is seen that is seen as problematic. So, for for many other reasons, but these two ones I think are very important. Uh, we do not pay sufficiently attention to the risk of letting this kind of regime and this kind of influence in Western societies grow and prosper. And, and that's one of our roles to, to alert uh, not only our uh, uh, bureaucrats at the elm of universities, but our governments, but what is the right, the, what is written on the wall really. And another question. Uh, yeah, the next question from an attendee, uh, they are asking, what can academics outside of India do to improve the academic freedom situation in India, or at least offer support to the faculty and students negatively impacted in India? Who would like to answer that? Well, I think there are limitations to what we can do sitting here because the institutional mobilization and public mobilization against those academics and students is so intense. But there are things we can do which require very little effort on our part. Number one, if you're asked to sign a petition, do so, right? If you are able to influence in any way through your scholarly networks, different representative groups in your discipline to come to the aid of scholars who are at risk, scholars who are facing real harm uh, of either using being used, you know, politically through legal tactics or through direct actual jailing uh, from being able to continue to work. I think those kinds of academic societies do have a role to play. And often they have been very hesitant to be involved in what they see as a political quote unquote side. Um, I would say that academic freedom is a human rights issue. It is not about politicization of particular topics or particular perspectives, because at its very, very base root, what academic freedom is doing is protecting the basic bedrock of what democracy is about. Could I and, ask, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, please go ahead. So in that sense, I think, really mobilizing academic networks to take it seriously, to question and bring up the self-silencing that is going on in our institutions, and also to actually teach it as part of the curriculum. I would actually be fairly astonished if the majority of students in most universities around the world have given serious thought to academic freedom, unless and until something actually blows up, right? We all think people knew about it, but I would argue that knowledge and awareness of what academic freedom is, how it is maintained, and why it needs to be preserved is at an all-time low. Uh, and I think this is actually a subject that should be discussed more often in the public realm by media and certainly be taught as part of the curriculum in most universities. Yeah, but, I mean, uh, You mentioned uh, one thing. Uh, I'd like to turn the question that you were asked a little bit around. Uh, 
so often when we're talking about academic freedom, it's we're focused on people who've been under explicit attack from the state, from diaspora groups, uh, or however. Uh, but you mentioned self-censorship. Christophe talked about the chilling effect uh, of these attacks. So the people who aren't being attacked, nevertheless, uh, often decide to avoid the problem by avoiding uh, these kinds of issues. What do we do about providing support or changing it so that, uh, let's not talk about India for the moment, let's talk about North America and Europe. What can we do to help change the narrative so people can exercise their academic freedom to pursue issues of interest to them and of scholarly relevance to them in the face of uh, the kinds of attacks they see colleagues under that cause mm -hmm. them to back away? I would say it's simple when we say it, but it's very difficult to do. Speak up. Okay. Become engaged, right? Um, we should not take these kinds of rights and freedoms for granted because they are not ones that are handed to us on a plate. It took generations of people to fight for those freedoms. And the minute we take them for granted, they disappear and shrivel up, right? Maintaining academic freedom, maintaining human rights, maintaining free access to public discussions are all things that require enormous amounts of effort. And if we stand back and say, okay, well, these few people, they seem to be gadflies. Um, they're always going to have their voice out and I'm safe because these people will always speak up. You're basically acting and taking a very passive approach to things that are of monumental importance. Um, and I think most people don't realize what academic freedom does to them. We just went through a global pandemic, right? In almost every country, if you look at who spoke up in terms of trying to think about the economic effects pandemics and government shutdowns were having on different groups in society. People who spoke up about what governments needed to do or not do, about the efficacy of vaccines, of the kind of really complicated nuanced things. These were usually academic scholars and bodies, right? Now, whether the public trusts them or not, the only check against government propaganda or corporate propaganda in our world today is really the institution of the academic universities or groups connected to them who have the space resources and training to talk knowledgeably about these things. But we have a responsibility to do it. And if all we want to do is teach safe topics and stick to a narrow line of what we can talk about and discuss, then we are not really fulfilling our duties and responsibilities as scholars. The world needs us to speak up, and it, we need allies who will speak up for us when we come under fire. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, would, I mean, the one one thing I would add um, to the first uh, part of uh, Purnima's response is that um, colleagues in what we can do for colleagues in India. I mean, I mean, I think I've spoken to some colleagues who have made decisions no longer to publish in in India for worry of censorship. Um, and I think being aware um, of, of that as evaluators of pieces of, you know, that, that there is this uh, political dynamic uh, that's happening where scholars of India in India feel like they can't publish in India. Um, and also because new government laws that say that publishers have to have certain books vetted by uh, a committee Put together by the government for approval these are any publishers on certain topics is is sort of a problem of, of a level that we haven't seen before um, but on the other hand when i talk to my colleagues here uh, in my department at my university in pointing out that there are some excellent students who want to leave india because they cannot actually pursue the research that they really want to do mm -hmm. um, because a they won't get government funding um, they want the institutions won't be able to support the kind of research they want to do. But as American universities are facing their own financial crises, um, they're limiting the number of international students that can enter into the US Academy. Um, and not being aware of that, I think, is also a problem, right? So we're sort of stuck. I mean, I've had more students from India contact me this year and last year than ever before. And um, and many of them are seriously desperate to leave so they can pursue their intellectual work, um, which is a great irony, of course, right? That they want to study India, but can't do it in India. 
I know it's pretty much and Christoph nodding their heads in agreement. So I take it. Oh yes, it's so so sad. You know, the it it it's like a brain drain. It's it becomes like a brain drain. The best minds are leaving the country to study abroad, and indeed to study their own country abroad. Well, and I take it the Indian state probably is not troubled by that. Uh, yeah. And one more question. Uh, yeah, uh, another question from Sanjay. Uh, Sanjay says students from India now comprise the largest segment of international students in Canada and perhaps in other countries too, eclipsing students from China. Question for all of the panelists. Have you noticed a shift among your students in the last decade and how they respond to your lectures, readings, et cetera, if they are critical of Hindu nationalism in, in, in any way? The wonderful thing about working with young people is they will always surprise you. Um, and by that, I mean, it's mostly what I have encountered in my classes. And I don't know, maybe it's use for the people I find in Seattle. Um, these are people who are curious. They are open-minded. They're skeptical of many of the things they have been taught in their textbooks. Um, and in that they have a lot in common with my students who were born and raised in this country, right? I mean, there's that very well-known uh, takedown of US history textbooks called Lies My Teacher Told Me. Mm -hmm. um, what I usually have students express is astonishment that the kind of curricula they're being exposed, you know, exposed to in uh, classes in the US are not only completely different from curricula taught in Indian universities, but also what is available online. Because the other thing we have not talked about is the kind of dumbing down of books on Indian politics, Indian culture, Indian history, that in a way has created a mass market of blogs, posts, movies, Bollywood musicals. And students are drowning in all kinds of very, very strange oversimplified views of these things, but they're hungry for more complicated and nuanced perspectives. More often than not, I find that students ask questions that really push me as an academic to think more deeply about these things. So I have encountered very few hostile questions. What I have mostly encountered are young minds that really want to be able to ask questions they would not feel comfortable asking anywhere else and then just being let loose on texts, on resources, on material artifacts to go and explore more. So in that sense, we can talk about this as a very, very depressing topic. On the other hand, every time I walk in a classroom, it gives me hope. Okay, um, and we, we may be able to squeeze in one more question if you have one. Uh, okay, did, did I, oh, sorry, did any, did Christoph and Vinayak, did you, sorry, I didn't hear. I think that was for all three of you. The, the last question by Sanjay, I find is very interesting. If you can read that out. Uh, in the Q&A? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, Vinayak mentioned how the National Security Advisor last year identified civil society as an internal threat to the state. On the one hand, his language was reminiscent of Chinese state rhetoric, ironically, in other areas too. For example, criticism of India is seen as interfering in its domestic affairs violating sovereignty, non-interference, et cetera. On the other, the tendency to tar any criticism of the politics and policies of the current government as Hindu phobic is analogous to uh, describing any criticism of Israel state policies as anti-Semitic. I wonder if the panelists see these, sees these comparisons similarly or differently. Christoph, do you want to start? Yeah, we have we have very little time, but I, I do think that is a very valid comparison. I mean, uh, the co I will focus only on the second one, the comparison between India and Israel, um, because I do think that uh, Indudva and uh, Zionism have deep affinities and, and result in political trajectories that make democracies at, at the best ethnic democracies where you have second class citizens because they are not part of the uh, majority. Uh, majoritarianism is, is a synonym for uh, ethnic democracy there. In Israel, it's de jure. This is a Jewish state. In India, the constitution says this is a secular country. Now it's a de facto 
Hindu Rashtra, so to speak, Hindu nation uh, with minorities de facto, second class citizens. The, the, the points uh, Vinayak and, and, and also Purnima mentioned in terms of reforms of the constitution, revisions of the law may gradually transform this de facto Hindu Rashtra into a de jure Hindu Rashtra. And this is probably one of the um, main um, threats that is also posed on the academics. So I think this comparison is very useful because it opens the eyes of those who know about Israel but do not know about India. And I, and I think it, it, it can be referred to in this perspective. I, I would add that that the um, American Hindutva organizations do collaborate with um, Zionist organizations in the U.S. Um, in terms of strategies and tactics. I mean, you can go online and look at some of the presentations of various Hindutva leaders who have openly discussed this. Um, so, I mean, that's actually happening. But at the state level, um, both in terms of security, surveillance, uh, Purnima's example of the bulldozer, uh, bulldozer tactics of Muslim neighborhoods um, that since 2018, uh, India and Israel have signed a uh, security pact, a cybersecurity and regular security pact of arms and a number of uh, tactical issues as well of training um, that you begin to see uh, sort of the convergence um, that's happening. I mean, and it's it's something that's happening more and more frequently um, uh, when you open the newspaper of, of various stories and issues uh, connecting Israel um, Israeli policies with Hindutva stuff um, as recently as yesterday or two days ago regarding the, this film festival in Goa where a filmmaker uh, from Israel was the chair and he made a comment about uh, the Kashmir files and the Israeli ambassador uh, was got involved due to a number of trolling and also pressure from the Indian government. So you begin to see very kind of innocuous comments from a filmmaker uh, that suddenly become uh, international news. Uh, I mean, it's covered all over by the international press uh, yesterday and, and the day before. So you're you're beginning to see. So Sanjay's question regarding um, both Israel and China, I think um, I think India is. The government is choosing to take um, tactics from both and in, in, in their forms of authoritarianism that they find effective for governance in India. I mean, so I think that's I think his his question was is a good leading question for us to <laughs> um, to think about uh, placing India between Israel and China in that way. And I would say that. I have seen this less in the classroom, but my students actually brought to my attention the strange parallelism that is going on right now between Hindutva activists online who are trying to make parallels between quote unquote Hindu genocide under the Mughals, which never happened with the genocide of Jewish people in the Holocaust. And if you think about it, this is very startling because the architects of Hindutva were admirers of the Third Reich right? Uh, their whole model for this down to the khaki shorts uh, were actually the SS. So, you know, history brings up some strange, strange parallel congruencies, but this is one of the worst that I have ever seen. In that sense, yes, I think those tactics are being mobilized in very, very strange ways. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to end there. Uh, clearly, this conversation could go on for a very long time. I really want to thank uh, you, Vinayak, and Purnima and, and Christoph for a, a really engaging, informative, uh, scholarly conversation. Um, and I wanna thank the audience for attending today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, a video of this will be posted on the CFE website, which is cfe.torontomu.ca. It'll be posted on our website tomorrow. And uh, I hope you will encourage any of your colleagues or friends who haven't had the chance to see it to to uh, lo log on there and see it. We'll also post links to various articles and books that have been mentioned over the course of the this conversation. And also you'll see on the website uh, our past events and our upcoming events. Uh, the next event is going to be on Wednesday, uh, December 14th. It's gonna to turn to focus on a very different issue and that is how the Canadian government is dealing with the issue of privacy. And a new bill they brought in 
to change the law in Canada on private sector privacy, which raises serious, serious questions. And we're going to have a conversation between uh, Teresa Scass, who's one of the leading scholarly experts on this issue, and the host of our uh, Taming Big Check, Taming Big Tech uh, series, um, uh, Andrew Clement, who's a professor emeritus from the Faculty of Information at the University of Toronto. So I'd encourage you to have a look at the website for that um, and for our other programs. And again, thank you to our panelists and thank you to the audience. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>